There is one stabilizing word in the Bible that Christians need to keep before them all the time. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted throughout the earth. We are Christians, and we are to play the part of Christians in such abnormally distraught days as these. One of our great journalists said a little while ago in an article that it behooved Christians to summon themselves afresh in a very faithful way so to speak and to work and to live as to enhearten and fortify a world troubled like the world is today. One wonders each day what the next day will bring forth. We are to keep our eyes on God and act up to all that he gives us. And then we may unfearingly leave ourselves in his blessed hand. There is an incident given us in the 14th chapter of Matthew, which was read you a while ago at the beginning of the service, which has in it some very revealing lessons for us. May the divine spirit, the author of this word, lead us into the apprehension of some of these lessons this morning according to the will of God. The heart of the incident is stated in this sentence. His disciples came to him, saying, Send the multitude away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, They need not depart, give ye them to eat. This miracle, as many of you must know, is the only miracle recorded by all four of the evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It is one of the most instructive incidents in all the New Testament. You will recall the setting for this text that I've announced. John the Baptist had just been beheaded by order of the cruel Herod and Herodias. His disciples took up his body and buried it and went and told Jesus. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness. And great multitudes followed him on foot out of the city, out of the town. They wanted to be near him. They wanted to see him. They wanted to hear him. They wanted to have his word and hand of help. Great multitudes followed him. And so he was out there in the desert with thousands around him. And the day wore on toward nightfall. And there was increasing restlessness among Christ's little band of disciples. And as the day went on toward the approaching night, these disciples came to Jesus and said to him, Master, the day is far spent. The night is near at hand. See these thousands, the women with their little children. We'll have a panic here directly. They must have something to eat, and we are in a desert place. Get rid of them. Send these thousands away. Send them into the villages hard by, that they may buy themselves victuals. Let's be absolved from them and absented from them. And he made the wonderful reply that why they needn't depart. Give ye them to eat. How much have you got? They said, five loaves and two small fishes. Bring them to me. And lifting his eyes to heaven, he blessed them. And then break them. And gave them to the disciples and said to them, Give ye these now to the people. And they were all fed, about 5,000 men. 
not counting the women and the children. It isn't any wonder that the incident closed with a statement of the people of a truth. Thou art the Son of God. Now there are vivid lessons in the incident for us today. First of all, we see that great lesson standing out, which is the most comforting lesson in all the Bible, namely, the compassion of our Savior and Lord for the people. He was moved with compassion when he saw the multitudes, beheld them, all types and temperaments and conditions and ages, the old and the young, the strong and the weak, the rich and the poor, the high and the low, people of various ages and races and conditions. He was moved with compassion. He felt with them. That's what compassion means. He felt with the people. Prophet Ezekiel had the same sort of feeling when he said of the people in his day among whom he lived and wrought and witnessed, I sat where they sat. I understand my people. I know their needs, their burdens, their dangers, their battles, their trials. I sat where they sat. Oh, how significant this word compassion. He was moved with compassion toward the people. He felt with them. He sensed their needs. He sensed their dangers. And highest of all, he sensed their possibilities. Oh, the grandeur of a human life. The grandeur of it. It may be besotted. It may be in the depths of drink and lust and sin. Oh, the grandeur of a human life to live on somewhere, personal and conscious, forever. What can compare with that? And we're to keep this sacred estimate of human personality. We're to keep that ever before us. That's the great teaching of Jesus. Nobody ever taught it like he taught it. What shall it profit a man if he shall gain Dallas County, Texas, North America, all the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Africa, the islands of the sea, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Jesus gives us that great appraisement of human personality. And the tragedy of this world this minute is that in large sections and on wholesale scale, men are being treated as mere cogs in a machine and ground to death with the awful horrors of war. Oh, what an answer. What an answer some men will have tomorrow at the bar of God. One thinks of Napoleon when his men remonstrated with him once. As he said, I want a hundred thousand men to go on this daring adventure. This daring adventure. And his officers drew near him and said, Sire, Sire, you lose all those men if you send them on this desperate adventure, a hundred thousand of them. And with a scornful curl of his lips, he said, what are a hundred thousand men to me? Think of man's view of life like that. That little hungry child today down yonder in the tent, on the outskirts of this city, which tent and surroundings are all marked by squalor and poverty. That little thing is intrinsically worth more than every dollar in every bank in the world. Jesus sensed the possibilities of life. The possibilities of a human life. And we are to have his spirit. As was he in the world. So are we to be. So are we to be. The man who can be careless and indifferent to any human life doesn't have Jesus' spirit. Doesn't have his viewpoint. You must not may not, dare not be careless touching any life of any age or condition or circumstance of your race and the other races. Human life is the precious thing in the sight of the great God who is over us all. And we are to keep that high estimate, Christ's 
appraisal of the measureless meaning of human personality. We are to keep that before us all the time. And all our standards are to keep that in mind. And all our ideals, and all our efforts, all our efforts, if we should spend all the money in the world from every quarter, and it should be sanctified of God to win one poor, little, bedraggled life from sin to God, the money would be well spent, for human life's worth more than it all. Jesus was moved with compassion. Oh, how the sight of the crowds does move us. You can see them. You can stand on any city, this city, and stand on a corner ten minutes and see them surging up and down the streets. Seamy faces, careworn faces, eager faces, apprehensive faces, fearful faces, happy faces, some. Oh, the problem of the multitudes. The problem of the multitude. And if we don't watch, we'll be utterly depressed and cast down these, uh, these disciples with Jesus, as the day wore away and night came on, said, Master, send these people away. It'll be night directly. and You've got nothing out here in the desert for them to eat. Send them away. Send them away that they may buy themselves victuals. Anything to get them out of our sight. <coughs> let's, let's be away. We'll have a panic here. We'll have all these babies crying for something to eat. And their mothers will be helpless to pacify them for we have nothing to eat out here. And he said, they need not depart. What have you got? Oh, they said, we've got five loaves and two small fishes, very little fishes. What are these among so many? Well, you bring them to me. And he invoked God's blessing upon them, and the multiplying power of God came down on the five loaves and two little fishes. And then he gave them to his disciples and said, pass these out to these people. And all were fed, and twelve baskets full were gathered up of the fragments. Some five thousand men, beside the women and the children. Oh, this is the way God does it. We are following a divine Savior. A divine Savior. We're not following some clever man simply. We are following a divine Savior, who can turn the very darkness into morning, who can turn death into life. We are following a divine Savior, and we are to act as those apprehensive and conscious of our great heritage and destiny as the friends and servants of Christ. Now, look at the two ways proposed here to handle these people out there in that desert. The disciples, look at their way, and then look at Jesus' way, and see which way we are, which way we are going to try to take. The disciples came to him and said, Master, the night's coming on, it's nearly sundown now. And President, we'll have the greatest panic ever seen in this desert. These people will be hungry and they'll manifest their hunger. Send these people away, these thousands. Get them away. Bid them go quickly that they may buy themselves victuals. Any way will take care of themselves. That's the way they propose. Send them away. Don't face it. Don't face it. Shut your eyes to it. Stop your ears to it. Run away from it. Don't face obligation. Don't face it. That's a, that's a terrible behavior. That's Satan's suggested behavior for all of us. Don't face it. It's too much anyway. It's unthinkable. It's unreasonable. Get away from it. You take a train and get away. Get in your car and ride away where you won't hear them crying for bread. Get away. Don't face it. That's the selfish cry of men and of Satan. Don't face it. Don't face it. It's, it's the ostrich-like method. They tell us the ostrich rushes away and puts his head down into the sand and, uh, and doesn't see, refuses to see. Get away. Don't face it. Just absent yourself. Withdraw yourself. Don't go down that road. Don't come into contact with that situation. Decline to face it. Decline to hear about it. Shut your ears to it. That's the proposal of the disciples of old. It's proposed all along. They said, we can't do it. We can't do it. Jesus said, how much have you got? How much food have you got? Why, nothing to speak of. What are the five loaves and two small fishes? What would that be among so many? Well, you will see. You bring them to me. Why, they said, we are utterly unable to do it. We are utterly unable to do it. They left out any thought of God, of his divine power, of his divine power, left it all out. 
left it out any reckoning or computation of divine reinforcement, and they pleaded inability, and because of that, let's, let's get past this very painful chapter for the present and get something more comfortable and more pleasing. It's the same old story down the years. There was never a great work proposed for Christ that somebody didn't say it can be done. Let's subtend ourselves now. This is, a, this is a chimerical thing. This is out of the question. It can't be done. Let's not face it. When Zerubbabel was rebuilding the temple, they cried on every hand, the thing can't be done. But he went on building the temple. When Nehemiah came to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, they said all around with derisive, scornful laughter, the thing is another hoax. It can't be done. But he went on building the walls, rebuilding the walls about Jerusalem. When Martin Luther started his great reformation against formalism and ritualism and perversion of the truth back yonder, generations ago, uh, he was bombarded and assaulted and intimidated or sought to be and threatened. They said, little monk, where will you be by and by when we've got you all cribbed and cabined in jail? Where will you be then? He said, I'll be right where I am now, in the hands of God, right where I want to be. And he went on. When William Carey, this great Baptist leader, yonder in England, the cobbler for shoes, with a map of the world before him, which he studied day and night, when he called a little band of uh, Baptists around him and said, the commission of Jesus is as plain as the fingers on your hand, that we'll go and tell the world about him. They said, why, that's chimerical, that's unthinkable, that's fanciful. That's uh, utterly foolish and futile. And he hammered away at his shoes, and he hammered away at his testimony. And by and by, he made such an appeal that one of the older men of ability to said, sit down, young man, sit down. When the Lord gets ready to convert India and the heathen world, he'll do it. Sit down. But he didn't sit down. He held on, and he wakened up our Baptist people in Europe and around the world, and he wakened up all our other fellow Christians to the God-given mission of Christ's people to carry the gospel of Christ to every human being. No matter about the Red Seas or the difficult mountains, no matter about the deserts to be crossed, no matter about the poverty of your resources, you go. You go. And if you'll go, I'll go with you. And wherein you lack, I'll make it up. I'll supply the sufficiency for you, but you go. And that man has done a work for the world beside which the statesman's work is a little simple thing, almost not to be mentioned. Not to be mentioned. Every work proposed to carry on the will of God and bring in the kingdom of God has this same sort of try and effect send him away. Let's get out of this. Let's get to something more pleasant. Let's move over and eat watermelons. Let's get out of this thing. Send them away. Send them away. Now look at Jesus' plan. And that's what I want you to see and what I want the pastor of this church to see all his days. They need not depart. What, what have I asked you to do? What are, what, what are your marching orders? What's the command I've given you? They need not depart. They need not depart. You bring me those five loaves and two little fishes. And he asked God's blessing upon them, his multiplying divine power upon them. And he break and gave it to them and gave it to them and they had... All they wanted to eat, those thousands and twelve baskets were left afterward. There is that scattereth, and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than his meat, and it tendeth to poverty. Great old John Bunyan wrote, there was a man, and some did call him mad. The more he gave away, the more he had. That's Christ's teaching, diffusion of your resources in response to the command of God means the coming back of more resources than you'll ever give away, and in far more blessed uh, ways than you can even dream, even in God's divinely multiplying way. Jesus acted while those disciples of his raised doubts and questions and uh, expressed their defeatist fears and said the thing can't be done. He acted while they questioned. Doubters don't get anywhere. Doubters don't get anywhere except downhill. In any realm in the world, doubters don't build great things. Doubters don't bring to pass great achievements. Doubters in the world of religion don't get anywhere except downhill. If any man will do the will of God, 
he shall know of the teaching, whether it be of God. Obedience to the will of God will solve every doubt. Every doubt will get away as the fogs go when the big sun comes up in the morning. Jesus acted while they questioned and doubted and cast. Jesus said, let's uh, take what you've got and see how far it'll go. And we saw how far it went. He says that to us. He says that to us. What have you got in your hand? What have you got in your hand, Moses? A rod, wield it. What have you got in your hand, Joshua? A spear, wield it. What have you got in your hand, Gideon? Lamps and uh, candles and uh, uh, pitchers. Go out among the people and wield them. And you'll rout the hosts of the Philistines. What have you got in your hand, Dorcas? A needle. Wield it. Wield it. That's your sphere, and you'll do great things with it. What have you got in your hand, Mary? An alabaster box, a precious ointment. I'm breaking it to anoint my master aforehand for his funeral. Oh, the wonders when we just take what God has given us and use it. And use it, the wonder of it. Think of two of our girls with their little modest salary wanting to build a home saying this appeal is so vital to us we cannot be comfortable about paying for the lot and building a home. We'll take care of one of those missionaries a whole year. $600 out of a little salary. I fancy that when they recorded that decision that a cavalcade of angels hurried back to heaven saying they're not all failing. They're not all failing. The kingdom of God is coming down on earth in the lives of some people. Jesus said, now let's use what you've got. Make it go as far as you can. Is it two mites? All right, bring them to me. And I can invoke a multiplying power on your two mites that will give immortality to your two mites. To your two mites. Jesus said, use what you have. Make it go as far as you can. Now, fancy, I pray you, what would have occurred... If the plan proposed by these disciples had been carried out, just get away. Get them out of our sight. Let's uh, get away quickly and have nothing to do. Wash our hands of it all. What would have happened? Well, two or three things would have happened. Two or three things would have happened if that had been done. Two or three things would have happened. What would they have been? Well, these disciples wouldn't have had enough for themselves. Five loaves and two little fishes with those twelve disciples, twelve apostles of Jesus out there, they wouldn't have had enough for themselves. What are they, what are they, five loaves and two little small fishes, what would they be for a dozen big brawny men? They wouldn't have had enough for themselves. And if you and I fancy that we can dam up the waters of salvation and keep it in a little pond in which we'll play with the rest of the world walled out and uh, locked out. If we imagine we'll get along with that, we'll find ourselves paupers and stranded and utter defeat. Selfishness is just as suicidal as to take a gun and put it to your temple and draw the trigger. Selfishness is self-defeating in every case. This First Baptist Church doesn't have the moral right to the plot of ground on which this building stands. If it isn't a church going out to help the world. It's in, it's a cumber of the ground. It's a fig tree that won't bear fruit. It's left here in the world to bear fruit. And if it refuses, fails to do it, this church doesn't have the moral right to the plot of ground on which the building stands. Selfishness is defeat every time. The selfish nation is doomed. The selfish church is doomed. The selfish family is doomed. And the selfish man is doomed. It's doomed. They wouldn't have had enough for themselves. What else? If that proposal of those disciples had been carried out, they'd have been guilty of murder on a wholesale scale. Uh, if they had been carried out, those thousands and thousands couldn't have got something to eat. Like they said in the villages, by him, traipsing back some way to get them, and they'd have died in myriads. And their blood would have been required at the hands of these men who could have done better. Ah, my brethren, my brethren, we cannot, dare not be indifferent to the cry of human need anywhere in the world. We cannot. Comrades, go read Christ's words again. They are the only hope of men. Love and not hate must come to birth. Christ and not Cain must rule this earth. And you and I are left here a little while to represent him. What sort of representatives are we going to be? What are we trying to be? What do we intend, please God, by his grace to be? Jesus would uh, have had a, a company of men on his hands who by negation had destroyed the people. 
And you want to remember that the sin of omission is just as grave as the sin of commission, inasmuch as ye did it not unto one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. When did we know you to be hungry? When did we know that you wanted something to eat, Master? When did you know that we were thirsty? That you, you were thirsty? Why, uh, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of my little ones left stranded in India and Ceylon and Jamaica and China and the Belgian Congo. You left my little servants out there hungry in the midst of darkness, chaotic. And you went on and wrapped your cloak around you and ate your melons and drank your interesting drinks of lemonade and maybe something more. Inasmuch as you did it not unto one of the least of these, you did it not unto me. There you are. What else? If the plan proposed with those disciples had prevailed, Jesus would have absented himself from them. He would have said, you're not my people. You're not my company. You're not my friends. You're not my comrades in a great world battle for human emancipation. He would have withdrawn himself from them. And then the defeat would have been utter and immediate and overwhelming and final. Here's the story for us. I felt I couldn't bring you a better story. For you and you and me, for us all alike, and to face a story like this as we face the most extraordinary call of our lifetime and the most emergent of our lifetime. And I repeat, I shall say it all over America if I'm given the chance to say it, if England should break down in this awful struggle, this colossal struggle, the struggle of the generations, of the centuries, if she should break down in this battle for human freedom on the largest scale in the world's history now being wrought out and fought out, she should break down. I don't hesitate to say that American Baptists shouldn't allow one of those British missionary Baptists to come back home or to starve on the field. Not, not one. Here we are pouring our billions, billions more than we can count in America on the altar for armaments. More than we can count. Billions and billions and billions and billions. More than we can count to kill people, to uh, withstand the invader. And to a degree, there may be a great deal in there of necessity, a patriotic and a human necessity. What am I saying? I'm saying that Christians ought to put first things first. The missionary program given them of Christ is the most important program beneath the star. Is it? Is it? Then if so, our response ought to be consonant with the biggest thing ever committed to man since the world began. Is this cause that we're talking about a matter for little potato peelings or orange rinds or maybe the denial of ourselves of one glass of lemonade? Or is it something in which we should go down to the deepest depths of our ability and say a cause like this shall get a gift from us, an offering touched with the sacrificial touch of the cross of Christ on Golgotha's hill?